The third pick goes to the New York Knicks. All righty, welcome everybody to another episode of the Knicks Wall podcast. On with me today, as he is pretty much every week, I've got my co host Brian Giberman. What's going on, my dude? I mean, I was nice enough to show up for the podcast. Yeah, I don't know. Somebody's either on sleeping duty or doggy duty, but we lost uh, we lost one Kyle Maggio, who uh, is the new father to a litter of very cute pit bull pups. Um, but we think that he may have been caught up in that, so we're just going going with the big two here, doing uh, <laughs> doing our thing. Uh, and it's a big day to celebrate. It's a hell of a pot for Kyle to miss out on because we are not mourning the loss of one Zion Williamson, but rather we are uh, we are praising and we are saluting and celebrating the arrival of Canada's own Canada's dry RJ Barrett. Brian, the Knicks have the third pick in the NBA draft. What's your reaction? So. What you just said right there is it's kind of crazy that we've already arrived at this point because we know Zion's going one, but we figured the Grizzlies who landed the second pick, there'd be like, sure, Morant was probably the favorite, but we figured there would have been some discussion. They'd bring both guys in. It would take it would take a little while for a decision to come. But literally, the day after the lottery, the first day at the NBA draft combine in Chicago, one of the most locked in NFL and oh NFL NBA draft mix, Jonathan Javoni from Draft Express, now they're part of ESPN, reports the Grizzlies have already made their decision and they're taking John Morant out of Murray State, which leaves RJ Barrett from Duke in what many people consider a three player draft. For the Knicks. So that kind of takes the decision making out of their hands. Now, I want to know if you agree with me. This is this is my bone to pick with it. I'm fine if the Knicks end up taking RJ Barrett. I would like them to not do what the Grizzlies are doing. I think you should go through, you do all your workouts, go into them open minded, whether it be thinking about Garland out of Vanderbilt, Culver out of Texas Tech, uh, Brandon Clark from Gonzaga, any other product, if you like Colby Wright from North Carolina, you should take in everything you can and then come into a decision. I do not want them to go, oh, hey, we're taking R.J. Barrett. It's done. Like, much like, and and I think there's evidence that this is how Scott Perry and Steve Mills will operate because it's that's exactly what they did with their coaching search. So take the philosophy they did from their coaching search and apply it to the number three pick. Yeah, I mean, I definitely agree with where you're coming from. I, I think that it is more of a, and it's definitely not a done deal. So I think it's it's more likely that the Knicks are starting to already settle on. Uh, on drafting RJ Barrett and are starting to more, uh, I think are setting their focus more on identifying what his faults may be and how they can improve them versus maybe doing their due diligence around the rest of the, uh, the prospects coming into the draft. Uh, but I, I think that there's definitely room for, I mean, there is, it's one and two and we're pretty sure we know how, how those are going to fall, whether Memphis is, making John Morant into a little bit more of a surefire than he really is. You know, maybe that's something we, we have yet to see, but uh, you know, it's, it's a three player draft, but it really does start to get murky at around three. And if you think that there's somebody else in that range, you know, and you've properly identified and do your, your due diligence and you've really sought out these players and gotten to know what their games look like. And you know, there's somebody that you just like more than RJ Barrett. If you're Scott Perry and Steve Mills, you, you know, you, you do what's going to look best for the franchise. But I, I kind of want to take a step back from just the draft talk and just identifying, 
you know, what necessarily then who the Knicks necessarily will draft with that pick, but just taking stock of where the Knicks now stand asset wise. There's obviously the the Anthony Davis rumors that are coming up and everything like that. And there's a lot of other moves that the Knicks want to do in the summer. We'll get a little bit more into all of them a little bit later, but just taking stock on what the Knicks inventory looks like right now. We've got you know the big pieces are that number three pick still. You know, it's not as bad as it would have been if if they fell to five, obviously. And and they still got some significant value at a three. And it's definitely not a complete and utter loss. But you have that, uh, you know, you you have that pick. You have the Dallas Mavericks picks that they acquired earlier in the year. You know, you have Mitchell Robinson's probably the the most valuable player that you have on the roster right now. You also have Dennis Smith Jr., who's, you know, other teams are also still pretty high on. You have Kevin Knox, who is hit or miss, but still has some kind of intrinsic value to him. You have these players and who, you know, they have a, a pretty decent war chest. And I just compared to some of the bigger players and the, the teams who you think may be shifting around assets this summer, where do you think the Knicks stand, I guess, in the grand scheme of things? When, when you look at theirs individually, I think with the Knicks specifically, I would start off, I would tier it as you have Mitch and number three as your best two assets right now. Then I think you probably go Dennis Smith Jr. and Knox as a level below those guys. Then below them, you're probably going Frank, Trier, Dotson. And so that's where you're starting from. Those are the pieces you're looking at with the Knicks. Um, I think it's somewhat similar to the Lakers. Now, the Lakers have a little bit more proven talent between Ingram and Ball and Kuzma. Like, they've all produced in an... At, in the NBA, at worst, at a replacement level, some of those guys have done even better. At most, they've all done better than that for stretches of play, and they're all s- still young besides Kuzma, Ball, and Ingram are still young, and they got the fourth pick. So I do think you probably have to put the Lakers a tiny bit above, but I, I don't think it's that much of a difference. And if you went, I'd rat Mitch is the best prospect out of everyone on those two teams. I don't think it's unrealistic to say. I think Lowe, like Zach Lowe, I think a lot of this talk came from what he said. And he basically said the Lakers pile of stuff rolls past the Knicks pile of stuff. And I'd say, sure, if you think the Lakers stuff is better than the Knicks, I have no argument with that. But I think there's a little bit more of a discussion and a debate to be had than low put out there I, I it's definitely a question of um you, uh, you know preference when it comes down to the team who's going to be coming after you know who the knicks or who the lakers may be dealing with you know obviously the one out there right now is uh is new orleans and the i mean the new orleans situation is just so fascinating now after last night i mean you have you know, them jumping into number one, even the Grizzlies getting number two is kind of wild, but you know, New Orleans making that jump to number one and just, they all of a sudden have that, they have the giant piece that was supposed to be what would land any team Anthony Davis. And it's, it's just, God, what an amazing twist of fate for them just to hold all of the cards right now. They should not trade Anthony Davis. Let me put that out there. If I am David Griffin, I keep Anthony Davis and I say, you're going to play with Zion. You're going to play with Drew. You're going to win 50 games this year. And then if you want to leave at the end of the year, giving up this really good roster and that core three, you can do it to take less money. I put him on, I make him, I would make him play. I think that's a top three that if Zion's as good as we all think he is, that if you get the right role players around, you could eventually win a championship with those three players as your best three players. And I wouldn't give that up. It's, I mean, it's really, I, I wonder if it's going to be one of those, you know, great combination of players that we just will forever wonder about because they never actually got a chance to play together. Like that, that's got to be one of the best defensive front courts just out of the gate coming in. And then on the offense, they can, you know, they're not going to, they're going to be records there too. It's, it's just, and then you got Drew Holiday who, you know, either way he's going to be feeding Zion. And just it's, I mean, it's just too good of a combination. And I know there's some been been some rumors coming out that Zion doesn't necessarily want to sign with New Orleans, uh, which is just completely laughable. But uh, 
Did you see that today where they said that Zion is considering going back to Duke for another year because he doesn't want to sign with the Pelicans? It, it, they base how I saw it got put out there was that he hasn't signed with an agent yet, which means he could go out to Duke, go back to Duke if he wanted to. But I didn't see anything saying that it was like something he was actually considering. And look, they could have those three players, and they they're gonna have now. But they, they won't have as much cap space as on as on the website that I'm looking at right now because Zion's gonna get added to that. But they're at 74 million right now. So even with sign, they're going to be able to add pieces to those three. Also, it's not, they're not completely capped out anymore. Like they have been in the past. That's a good team. Like there's, I would say that they could be the third, maybe second or third best team in the West next year. If they kept it together, everyone bought in and everyone really tried and played hard. I don't doubt that at all. I think that's absolutely spot on. But I, I think I don't think that that's what the rest of the league is thinking right now. And that's definitely not how you know people are examining this situation. It seems to be that the you know what everyone's kind of clamoring for. It, it just still seems to me in everyone's eyes that AD is as good as gone. And whether that's true or not, that's kind of how you know that's kind of how it's being examined. And that's kind of how we need to take that as you know being the team that that's on you know as much on their heels to try to get him as anybody else like we gotta you try to put together i guess as best of a package together as possible but uh i mean let's just listen to what brian winhorst had to say about the whole situation it depends on what the pelicans focus is if the pelicans want to go all young and build around zion i think the knicks have the best package to offer they can offer the number three pick they can offer a couple of young players that they have on their roster Ooh. right now Kevin Knox, uh, Dennis Smith Jr., Mitchell Robinson, the two first-round picks that they got from the Dallas Mavericks. I like those two. All of those things could come together. Um, That's a factor. From what I understand, the Pelicans are not interested in making a deal with the Los Angeles Lakers. Maybe had they gotten the filet mignon, yes, the, 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 Zion, egg, two, the Zion pick. Right. Yes. But the Pelicans have the filet mignon or the crawfish etouffee, whatever you want to say <laughs> in this scenario. And the Lakers have a, have a nice ribeye, but they don't have the filet. So I, I think the Lakers are actually still out of position. Do you think that's true? Like, Do you think that the, the Pelicans are still unwilling to deal with the Lakers? And I guess on the other side of that, do you think that the, you know those three picks from the Knicks are going to be you know, what it takes to get it done, or it, is it really going to be like the entire system here? As an extremely petty person, yes, I can believe that the Pelicans still would not deal with the Lakers. But that, look, there's some teams that we're not talking about. Like, I don't think that the Knicks have the best package that could be put together. What happens if a team like the Nuggets decided, hey, I want to pair up Anthony Davis and Nikola Jokic because Davis can play with him and help cover up some of the flaws that Jokic has and give us the rim protection we need and also create, still have the spacing on offense that we could play through them. And they went, Hey, we can throw some, we could put like Gary Harris, Jamal Murray, Michael Porter, Jr. Torrey Craig, Monty Morris. Like that's a hell of a lot of young talent that they could add and put together. Ones that the Kings went, Hey, we'll take a shot at this and, and do it. They could do something starting, with Marvin Bagley. Now that's more along the lines of in range of the Knicks. If the Clippers want to get in the mix and all the pieces they have. So I really don't agree with Windhorse just like blankly staying. The Knicks have the best package that can be put together. I don't think that's true at all. Do you think that the Knicks have, I mean, do they have the best picks available to go out? Because you would think that, you know, the, maybe the Lakers combination of players with that fourth pick is probably, you know, it's probably a better offer than just the Knicks core and even the pick above it. But, you know, I guess for New Orleans, you could look at the number three pick as an opportunity to pair, you know, RJ back with Zion and build that as a core to kind of go around for the future. But I mean, there's even other teams like you could still even see Boston getting involved in this. Like, I, I was listening, it was on a the Ringer NBA show today, like they were going over the potential lineup. And uh, yeah, I don't know if Horford necessarily goes for this, but you know, you have the you have the Horford trade and you have, you know, Jason Tatum going down there and you have all of a sudden you have a starting lineup where you have like you have 
uh, Drew Holiday, you got Tatum in there, you got uh, you got Horford, you could you know essentially get you know whoever else is a defensive prospect. Like just th- like there's so with Drew and Zion being there, you know there's so many ways that they could like pair this team up to have defense like top tier defensive talent. Like I just think that they have. They definitely are going to have offensive ability regardless of if they keep Anthony Davis or not. It, it only gets better on both ends if they keep him around. But, you know, if they move him, like, they could still get some combination of, like, you know, acceptable offensive players and just lock down defensive types. And that would be a pretty scary lineup to be, you know, to face with moving on, you know, as, as they kind of try to rocket their way up through the up through the Western Conference. It's, it's fascinating what they could do. Say they did trade Davis the flexibility of how kind of unique Drew and Zion are, are as players. Like if you wanted to, you can make Drew your two guard and pair him with another point guard. And they could just be able to just go back and forth because of Drew's side and who he can defend. And he can also play off the ball. He can play on the ball. You can play Zion at the four or the five and get a bunch, get wings and kind of construct the team around him. Like the Bucks did with Giannis and just put a bunch of shooting around uh, because of how good of a passer is, you could also play Zion with like a more natural big and because you can kind of get rid of those spacing issues because of the interior passing. It's David Griffin got like his job just got a hell of a lot better than any of us expected it to be like there. There's a path to them being good very quickly with or without Davis. So we haven't talked nearly enough about, you know, who we project the Knicks to be drafting with the number three pick, and that's R.J. Barrett. Um, I, how familiar are you with his game? Not as much as I'd like to be, but I have seen Duke. Uh, I Duke. Yeah, I mean, they're on TV all the time, so I have seen Duke a fair amount, but I never dug into him. Like when I'm watching, like when I when I'm scouting for the draft, what I like to do is I basically just watch the one guy on the screen and then I don't pay attention to anything else. So I see what he's doing off ball. I see what he's doing on ball. I see how he's playing team defense and stuff like that. So I haven't done that with RJ Barrett yet, but I have seen and read a lot about him. Yeah. So, I mean, I'm kind of in a similar position where I'm I'm really just trying to catch up on him, you know, now and in the last day or so and just, my immediate reaction seems to be, and this might be kind of an odd comparison, but I see him doing a lot of similar things to what Knox did during those couple of stints where he was good last year. Like the, his shot is a lot faster than Knox's. He can pass a lot better and he can, you know, he's able to be, show a lot more confidence and a lot more consistency around the rim. And those are all things that we've been clamoring for Kevin Knox to get better with this past year. But, uh, it just it looks like you know not where Knox has played at a high level this seal this uh season has seems seems to be what RJ Barrett's floor might look like going forward from how I'm reading it. And he just but it it's just the way that like Barrett uses his his pretty slender frame. He can get he can really dance around players, especially when they kind of, when the defense collapses in on him and he's pretty good at being able to put it up around the rim like that. Um He's definitely got a good leap to him. He can definitely, uh, you know, dunk pretty well off of a standing position or off of a pretty slow transition. Um, you know, he's not afraid to shoot in people's faces, and all these things are subject to be tested once he gets playing at the NBA level. But, you know, from what I'm seeing right now is he looks like he's got good control. He's got good vision of the court. He can knock down the shots, and it's just, it seems pretty clear to me how he can t- he can continue to improve those things and become a quality NBA player. I can also see him becoming a streak shooter, you know, very, very, very easily. Where I think him and Knox differ a little bit is Knox doesn't do as much with... Barrett is basically going to be the guy where I think Knox and Barrett can play off each other. Because a lot of Knox's stuff came off action or playing off other people. So Barrett could be that guy that he would play off off of so like the ball would be in Barrett's hands and he'd be doing the creating and then Knox could 
come off and do the quick decision making and make the quick moves off of Barrett's decision making. Now Barrett needs to clean up the decision making a bit. He needs to improve the shooting percentages across the board. Like I saw him, people compared him and like, oh, his ceiling is James Harden. And that's just e no, I don't I don't see that. Like Harden in college shot 57% from two, 40% from three, and 75% from the line as a freshman. Barrett's percentages as a freshman were 52% from two, 30% from three, and 66% from the line. And we're talking about two different animals here. And I think Harden turned the ball over less than him. Yeah, I mean, mm-hmm. and Harden and Harden averaged less turnovers in pretty similar amount of minutes. So from the offensive perspective, I've seen some people throw out the name of him as a ceiling. I don't think, I don't think we're talking about that level of player here. Now, there's nothing wrong with that. James Harden's arguably the best player in, in the NBA. So it's fine if we're not getting James Harden. There's stuff about Barrett that we can like, and there's a place for him on this team. Now, my thing I, is... I've, go, yeah, ahead, go, go. go ahead. No, you go, you go. No, my 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 thinking was just uh, the name that I've heard thrown around a lot, and I kind of like this is a an Eddie Jones for a more modern day era. Um, kind of seems like a similar build. I I think Barrett might be able to, you know, put on a little bit more weight and be able to, you know, add a little bit of heft to that more slender frame. But just I think I think the shooting touch and you know how I think that will get better in the NBA and stuff like that. I, I see that comparison being a little bit more clear. If I'll, I'll put it this way, though, if the summer goes how we hope it goes in free agency for the Knicks, my number one priority is to trade the pick for a veteran that can help you win right now. Yeah, I'm it, real torn. It's not. Look, it's just I we, we watched the we like we saw the movie with the Celtics. What happens when you try to do this balancing act of young and vets and half measures? If the Knicks get Kevin Durant, he's 30 years old and he's had 30 or well, played over 30,000 minutes in his career. Kyrie, he's at, I did this math earlier. Like with uh, where he's at right now plus his playoff minutes, he's at just he's just about to break 37,000. Yeah. So like he he will he will break 37,000 if he comes back in these playoffs and they make it to the finals. It is it's winning time right now if they get these guys and just rookies it's it's very unique for a rookie to be able to contribute in a positive winning way from the get go. That that's just how it is. Like you have these, you have exceptions, but for the most part, a rookie is not going to be a positive contributor. And it, it's not time. I don't. I don't have three years to wait around for R.J. Barrett to put it all together and be good. It's they. The top priority, I want to maximize Kevin Durant's window. I want to maximize Kyrie Irving's window if the Knicks are lucky enough to get those players. So whether it be Bradley Beal, Anthony Davis, a name that we have no idea is available that will become available down the line, that it's trading the pick. And I, I've gotten yelled at, like, oh, the contract, you don't give up nine years. Yes, you do. You have... You're going to have four, you have two to three years maybe of Kevin Durant's prime. I don't give a shit about nine years from now. I want to fucking win right now and I want to win a title. I tweeted this out earlier from the podcast account. And we, I've, I've actually been talking about this topic like on and off all day with a couple of people on that account. So, Jess, all you guys for, uh, for chatting with us there. But, you know, I, I really think that LeBron and, and Durant, once they come to the Knicks, will be kind of that litmus test for. Wait, hold, the, hold on, hold on. LeBron's coming what? to the Knicks? No, no, I'm the Le- LeBron with the Lakers and Kevin oh, Durant with the Knicks. Okay, you confused me. I was sorry, like, wait, sorry, we're sorry, Le- sorry. We're getting LeBron and no, KD. No, 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 we, we are not. We are not. I don't know if any they won't even trade for LeBron at this point. I'm just kidding about that. <laughs> um, but no, I, I think that I think that LeBron going to the Lakers and how that, you know, a year into that contract now going on to year two and, you know, Kevin Durant potentially coming to the Knicks and, and starting off that contract it's going to be an interesting i think a way to check how the nba and how teams are going to handle the megastar signing a contract that will he'll be in his prime when he enters it but he will not be in his prime by the end of that and 
you know, if there was one or that one or two year window that, you know, maybe three year window, you know, at the beginning of that contract, will that be worth the fourth and the fifth year? That's just going to completely, you know, hamper and, you know, basically destroy your flexibility towards the end there. You know, I, I, I think that when we look at what free agency is going to look like in five years from now or, you know, as we get into the 20s, it's it's going to be interesting to see if these kind of, you know, mega contracts for huge stars who are going to exit that status before the end of that contract, if they'll still be approached the same kind of way. Now, within the construct of I want to trade some of the young guys for vets, the two guys I think are most important to keep because they are the pieces that kind of bring everything together and make it cohesive around ball dominant stars. Your two top priorities are going to be Mitchell Robinson and Damian Dotson are the two guys I think are most important to stick around. Knox. And there's a gap between the two of those two players. Yes. Oh, 100%. I'd say, yeah. Uh, Knox could maybe end up being what Dotson is. Like the three point shooting is there, but the defense is there's such a large gap between the defense. And I also think Knox, because of his contract, will be more attractive in a trade than Dotson. Like the Knicks will have his bird rights right. after the upcoming season. So they'll be able to re-sign him and go over the cap to do that. But he only has one year left on his deal. And then he's going to get, it's, I wouldn't say substantial, but he's going to get some real NBA money in his next contract. So Knox is probably more attractive to another team than Dotson. And Dotson's defense is better than Knox right now. Like he's the consummate role wing. Like he's perfect. That's how you draw him up right. with Dotson. I mean, that's why he would be great. That's why he would be great if the free agency goes as planned. You can pretty much just plug him in and he's going to be able to fill in those gaps. Yeah. And I'm more like Dennis Smith's a guy who, look, this isn't about not liking Dennis Smith. It's that he's a guy who needs the ball in his hands. You're not going to play him with Kyrie. So I'd rather move him for a star in a package for a star than have him come off the bench. Frank in theory, is a role player that fits around, but we already know Dotson can shoot. So if it comes down to it, number one, Frank makes more money and you're going to need that money to match up with the deal. So I'm willing to move on from Frank and I'd rather keep Dotson. So that's the package. What can you get for that Frank, Dennis, th- number three pick, and Knox? Like what? what is out there that you could get for that package? And that's what I would be exploring. That's what... That's what I'm wondering too. Like, are we just? I mean, we're definitely looking at this off season with some tunnel vision. I mean, the the amount of. I mean, hell, we were we were talking about trading Zion before we even had Zion. Like, we were as a collective fan base on the day of the lottery, make you know, looking at reports and saying like, well, you know, once the Knicks get Zion, they're just going to trade him anyway. You know, like. We are looking at this offseason like KD and Kyrie are a guarantee, and we all have different opinions on how, how great that guarantee is right now. You know, we were looking at Zion as a guarantee. It didn't quite happen now, and it's just... I wonder if we're looking at these trade scenarios with too narrow of an eye. It feels to me like it's Anthony Davis or nothing. But I wonder, and I haven't done enough research on this to even really have an answer right now, but I wonder who that those other players are out there, those those other contracts that would line up with what the Knicks are trying to do and have you know, a quality player that could come contribute right now. I don't know. It's curious. But, I mean, there definitely are people out there who are, you know, convinced of the status of what the Knicks are going to look like going into the season. I, I think that one of the most outspoken people, I mean, we saw this earlier today or, you know, yesterday, depending on when you listen to this, is, you know, Stephen A. Smith had a pretty big, uh, rant about how unhappy he was on the result of the Knicks getting the third pick, which is gold. But even earlier this week, we had a clip from Stephen A. Smith saying that, you know, pro- that he he has his sources and they're telling him uh, certain things about what the Knicks may do. Let's listen in. From what I'm told, it's not going to happen. Um, I got a text message from folks uh, close to Kyrie's family uh, within the hour as we were teasing the subject. Quote, there is no way in hell he's going to L.A. I don't give a damn what anybody says. Knox, 
that down for us right now, please. He ain't going to L.A. That's what they say. I would tell you that if he ended up in L.A. with LeBron, it would be formidable. I think it would make them Final Four in the Western Conference. Uh, they'd make meaning they'd get at the very least to the conference semifinals. I don't think there's any question about that. But from everything that I've been hearing over the last few days, Kyrie Irving's heading to New York City. Kyrie Irving is heading to yes, Madison sir. Square Garden with Kevin Durant. I like it. Um, Talk to me. Uh, his, you know, people in his inner circle are trying to bring the Nets into the mix. Uh, but clearly, New York is the destination. <laughs> the likelihood is that it will be MSG. And obviously, Max, and I'm just, I, I will admit, I'm saying this for your entertainment, Max Keller, because I know it's going to get you going after I say this. I am told that James Dolan himself has basically said, whatever the hell you want, I will move the hell out of the way. I will give you whatever you want. It doesn't matter. Okay, I'll say, i take care of you. To the Kyries and the Kevin Durant of the world. So it appears to be a foregone conclusion. I don't know whether that's true or not. Neither Kevin Durant nor Kyrie Irving are talking about these things. Uh, but I am telling you what the belief is. They are destined to go to MSG, which is why I put it at 95% on my social media page, because the 5% that people leave open is wiggle room, because they say, particularly with KD, he's a very emotional individual at times, and sometimes, you know, he'll sit there and, you know, he's, he's firm in his commitment, but then the emotions get the better of him, and he might want to rethink something. So they don't, they say it's never safe to say something is a 100% foregone conclusion with KD until it's done, but they did use the number 95% to say that it's New York City MSG. And obviously That's some tea leaves. Kyrie is going to. From Jesus. what I'm told, it's not going to happen. Um, yeah, gotta- that was a uh, that was a long Stephen A. clip. But, uh, that, yeah, that is certainly some tea leaves. I mean, he called it a foregone conclusion. He called it, uh, you know, I think I believe he may have said the word destiny at some point in there. Um, you know, Kyrie Irving is not going to LA. He says it's, it's more than if Kyrie, if KD goes, he's going there. This isn't exactly, you know, news that we're breaking here, but I don't, does, does this report, does this Stephen A source, uh, I, I trust have any way of news, impacting your thinking on this what summer? Stephen A says, uh, it's just, yeah, it's just more, as we said, more tea leaves. It just, Keeps coming out, and that—that's about as strong as I've heard someone say that both of them are coming. Like we've heard KD, and pretty much everyone's like, "Yeah, KD's going to the Knicks." That's that's a done deal. We hadn't really heard it to that extent with Kyrie, so I thought that was the more interesting part of that of the little rant Stephen I had there. Well, we certainly, uh, you know, time will tell as time is told that the New York Knicks will likely not be drafting Zion Williamson. Time will tell what happens with uh, with Katie and Kyrie. So in the meantime, we are going to uh, turn our focus to talk to a uh, someone from another team to uh, discuss where their team is looking what their uh, team's free agency is going to be looking like this summer. We have Brad Rowland coming on the show in just a second. But first, I wanted to tell you all about our new sponsor, ShipStation. Uh, When you are selling online, getting your orders out can be a real pain. It's time consuming. It's expensive. There are so many carriers to choose from. How do you know that you're making the best choice? That's why you need ShipStation.com. It is the fastest, easiest, most affordable way to manage and ship your orders. ShipStation helps you get orders out quickly, save money on shipping costs, and keep your customers happy. No matter where you're selling, Amazon, Etsy, your own website, ShipStation brings all your orders into one simple interface, making them really easy to manage from any device, even your cell phone. And right now, listeners to the Knicks Wall podcast and any Blue Wire podcast can try ShipStation for free for 60 days when you use promo code BLUE. There's no risk. You can start your free trial without even entering your credit card info. ShipStation works with all the major carriers, including USPS, FedEx, UPS, even Amazon Fulfillment. So you can compare and choose the best shipping solution for you and your customer. 
No wonder ShipStation is the number one choice of online sellers. You'll ship more in less times with the best rates available. Just visit ShipStation.com, click on the microphone at the top of the homepage, and type in blue, that's ShipStation.com, then enter promo code blue. ShipStation.com, make ship happen. Uh, Let's talk to Brad. We are back on the Next Wall podcast, and we are joined here by Brad Rowland. Uh, Brad, you are a host on Locked On Hawks. You uh, contribute over at Peachtree Hoops. Um, your Twitter handle is at BT Rowland. Make sure you go give him a follow. How are you doing today, man? I'm doing all right. You know, it's it's that's that time of year when we're all very busy talking about all kinds of things, but uh, always happy to talk about some Hawks and lottery and whatever else is going on. Yeah, I mean, I guess that's kind of the place to start, right? A big night for uh, for you know both of our teams last night, and the Hawks were definitely a team that I expected a little bit more space between those two picks. I guess I kind of like put them as one of those teams where I have no idea. Like, obviously, I have no, no insight on it, but I figured Zion would be drafted by them. <laughs> uh, so I, I guess reacting to my conjecture there, you know. I guess wh- where where do you guys sit with eight and ten? What do you what's the move for the Hawks uh, at this point? Or is it a keep or is it a sell kind of move? Yeah, it's interesting. I mean, the odds are, are what they are, but um, it was kind of a worst case scenario for the Hawks. I guess they had a a zero point six percent chance to fall to number nine, but aside from that, you know, eight was kind of their realistic floor, which is kind of brutal coming into a lottery. I know you can sort of identify with that on on your end as well. But yeah, I mean, eight and ten. I mean, I guess. There was some doubt that the Hawks would even get the, get the pick from Dallas, so that pick coming is a good thing. So at least they have two picks in the top ten, but um, the, their own pick falling to eight is kind of brutal, and that kind of leads to a situation where maybe one of their guys falls to them at eight. Um, ten, it's really kind of a mess right now, um, especially, and it, and it might be that way at eight as well. Like this is a pretty flat and kind of ugly late lottery where there aren't a lot of guys who I love necessarily. So. It wouldn't blow me away if they did some moving around. They have they now have five picks in the top 44, which is interesting. And they don't really want five rookies. Even you know Travis Schlenk, the GM, said already on the record that they don't that they, that they don't want five rookies. So that kind of leaves you with a situation where you're either trading out or trading up. Uh, everything else doesn't really work if you're trying to not bring on a bunch of different guys. So a lot of uncertainty. I was hoping for some more certainty, honestly. Even if it was like pick three or four, it would have been a lot more certain than what they actually ended up with now. Did you want the Mavs pick to transfer over this year, or were you hoping to to wait till next year for it? I was on record as saying that I wanted it to convey, but if it didn't convey, it wasn't a disaster, if that makes sense. Like it was more like a 60 40, you know, maybe 70 30 kind of thing where I would not have been bothered. This, this draft is not great. Um, and as a result of that, that's kind of why you, you might have some uncertainty there but in the end i kind of landed with wanting the pick and wanting a top 10 selection with the certainty that comes with that because you know next year it's still top five protected and there's always a chance that dallas you know is a lot better they have cap space they obviously have luca they have porzingis potentially and whatever they did in the draft so you know if they had at the stars of the line they suddenly were a playoff team you're talking about you know maybe the 17th pick next year versus the 10th pick this year or the ninth pick this year you know next year's draft is, isn't supposed to be great either so all things equal i think the safety of just having the pick probably outweighs the fact that this draft is not great so you know i think that worked out well for them you know even that they got a little bit unlucky you know they're supposed to be the number nine pick um but that was, i guess the most likely scenario and they actually fell to 10 but all things equal, I would have taken the pick. So that's a, a slight positive for Atlanta. And that was top five protected, right? Yeah, it's top five. Uh, well, I guess now it's over, but it, it was supposed to be top five for this year and next year. And then it became top three gotcha. after that for a couple of years. So, yeah, it's uh, interesting. I mean, I, I, I'm already seeing people that are upset uh, about the the way the trade looks now. But, you know, they kind of projected that pick to be in the eight or nine range. So getting it at 10 is kind of what they thought it was going to be. I mean, that seems about fair to me when you're giving up Doncic and, you know, the Mavs made the moves that they made and everything. It's 
pretty much expected that they're going to, you know, them falling inside that top five and then ending up with whatever player they acquire there. I mean, that pick's only going to get worse as it goes along. For sure. And that's that's the thinking. I mean, even if at, at the very least, Dallas would be trying more next year. You know, they, they really punted down the stretch this year to get to that spot where they actually were. And, you know, even if Porzingis isn't super healthy, they're going to try a lot more in free agency. They're going to be playing more next next year than they were this year. They kind of went into a full tank mode. So, you know, even if it was a bad year for Dallas next year, I would imagine it would still be a worse pick. So I think you just take it and run. And now you now you, now you have these two picks in the top 10. So, I mean, like kind of thinking beyond the, beyond the picks a little bit now, beyond, beyond the draft, the Hawks have a pretty considerable amount of money in, uh, you know, salary cap space going into the summer. I'm seeing about 49 in practical cap space. Um, you know, that, that's a lot. And I, I wonder, like you have a, the team has a pretty good young core. Now you could potentially be adding, you know, whatever players you add late in the lottery or even potentially move up with the, you know, the amount of picks they have right now. What are, I mean, what are the team goals to go in now? Is there a certain position of need you think you have to fill or is it still just kind of acquiring talent mode? For me, it's acquiring talent. You know, they've at least publicly been saying that they, that they don't want to speed things up. You know, a lot of the local media, as you might imagine, they sort of overachieved this year. People are really excited. And it's like, all right, now it's time to make the playoffs. And no, not necessarily. I mean, they, they could because the East is the East and because they have some interesting talent, but um, you know, the GM and the head coach and everybody that kind of matters are saying the right things. And they're not really in a hurry to go ahead and speed this thing up. And I kind of agree with that. They have a lot of cap space, but I'd still be in talent acquisition mode. You know, if, if something, you know, great in free agency, a huge value falls in your lap and go ahead and sign it. Or if you can get Kevin Durant or, uh, you know, Kawhi Leonard to sign, go ahead and do that. But aside from the top, top guys that probably are not going to come, obviously um, I wouldn't be you know in a hurry to go pay, Jimmy Butler or something like that to try to speed things up. I would be sort of taking, you know, value contracts, you know, last, last summer, they signed a couple of guys, you know, relatively cheaply to be more competitive and just have some young veterans. That's not a bad route to take, but in general, everything except for point guard is still kind of up in the air. They do have some interesting talent, you know, Kevin Herter, John Collins, but Trey young is the only guy who's like, written in pen to one specific spot. Even Collins, who's by far the second best asset they have is a sort of hybrid big man. So they can kind of build around him and in, in a couple of different ways. So it's basically add anything that's not a point guard and uh, figure it all out later. Now, as the resident Hawks fan on this podcast and for our, <laughs> and, and for our website, in a way, isn't because of the skill sets of what young and Collins are, and where you want to go, isn't there, you, you don't really want any more, no offense, uh, all offense, no defense players though. Right. Yeah. I mean, I'm actually probably the person locally that's banging the drum loudest because they just need defense at some point. It doesn't have to be, you know, all defense, no offense guys, but to your point, they're like young and Collins, you know, and her to a lesser extent as a supporting piece so far in this rebuild, they've really leaned towards offense and skill. And, you know, Travis Schlenk is someone who talks about dribble pass and shoot a lot. They want skill and shooting. And I totally get that. But at the same time, if you want to, you know, rebuild with an eye towards real legitimate contention, you got to play defense. And right now they basically have no defensive talent on this roster. The best defensive guys they had were veterans who were on short term, short term contracts, all the young pieces are better offensively than they are defensively. And that is definitely true with Collins and young who are their two best assets. So yeah, I mean, somewhere along the way, they're going to have to get some defense and I I'd be sort of pushing for that. I don't, I don't think it's something where you have to just favor defense on the whole, but I'm with you that you really can't afford to add, for instance, a wing or a center, especially that's not a defensive player. Um, at least on some level, especially in terms of big men, you pretty much have to find someone that's more of a defense first player now with Collins, just just logically in the way that defenses have to be built. Your big men just can't be weaknesses and Collins might be a weakness. He might be okay eventually because he's a pretty good athlete, but next to him, you have to find someone who's going to be pretty good defensively and young is a disaster. And they, they knew that going in. So no big surprise. And his offense is really important, but they're going to have to sort of build around him defensively. And that requires some talent. Yeah. Because I mean, at this point you're banking on that, Collins and Young, like you have a top 10 offense. That's it's there. It's going it's going to happen. So kind of circling back with the draft plus what we just talked about, is there anyone at eight and ten that kind of fits the description of what you need, whether it be wing or big man? 
I mean, there's there's a few guys who could be available in that range. You know, the Hawks have been famously tied to Cam Reddish for a long time. I don't love, love that. But at eight, it wouldn't be so bad. He may not be there, obviously. Um, but that's someone who they've actually been, like, reported and linked and actually have real intel for. I've even heard that from people in the front office that, that, that they like him a lot. And defensively, he's a pretty interesting prospect. He kind of got crapped on quite a bit this year for the way he played at Duke. And justifiably so, he was pretty bad. But he's someone who has length and talent. Um Fit wise, though, my, my favorite guy, at least until today, was Brandon Clark. And then he measured with a six, eight wingspan. And that worries me considerably. I do like him, but he's sort of that like jack of all trades, you know, energy athlete, defensive, you know, cleanup kind of guy that they really could use. I'm not sure if that's still going to stick now with his measurables. Um, you know, it's kind of a mess, though, in that range, as I was saying at the top of this podcast, like there's not anybody that you love, like maybe maybe Nazir Little as a physical specimen kind of player, but he's definitely more of a project theoretical guy. He was kind of bad, too, at Carolina and all the other guys that you see mocked in this range, whether it be, you know, Bull Bull and he's kind of a defensive mess. And, you know, Goja Batatsi, I think is his name, is another big man who was has some some defensive questions. So no real like perfect two-way fits unless they get lucky and someone like, you know, Culver or Reddish or Hunter falls, which seems to be unlikely, even though I guess maybe one of those guys could get to eight. But other than that, it's not perfect, which means you, you could be looking at trade down scenarios or maybe trying to reach for somebody, which you never want to do. I didn't see the, I didn't see who the report came from, but did you buy that noise that they would have taken Culver if they got the second pick? It was a Sean Devaney report from Sporting News. I did see that. Um, I think it was more a instance of they were not going to take Morant, which I've been saying for months. That's something that I was just there was no way they were going to do that. You know, people want people locally wanted to say that they would maybe play those guys together. It was never going to happen. Um, I think they like Culver. Um, I'm not sure they would have taken him at two. It's one of the situations where I'm sure they would have explored trade scenarios just logically. We saw that last year. They're willing to trade down uh, even when it's not popular. And I think they would have done that. I guess maybe if they just, you know, if, if no one tried to trade with him, I guess maybe they would have taken Culver. But I think it would have been trade first, second, and third. And maybe you just take Culver as your last case scenario. You, you just have to make the pick. They do like him and he makes a lot of sense. He's a two way guy and they need two way guys. But, you know, I guess it doesn't really matter now because I, I I can't imagine him falling to eight, but maybe you will. I mean, maybe something crazy happens and the point guards rise and a team falls in love with Reddish and you kind of just can construct a scenario where maybe someone like Culver or Hunter falls to eight. But they do like him. I can tell you that. I'm just not sure if it was like enough to take him at two or enough to like make this massive trade up now that they probably have to do to actually get him. All right. Last one from me here. And you, you better give me something on this one because I made a bet. <laughs> I drunkenly made a bet with one of my friends last year that the Hawks were going to make the playoffs next season. So in free agency, what role players do you think they could look at that also fit the description we were just discussing outside of those obvious guys at the top that they would clearly take if one of them said they were going to Atlanta? Yeah, it's it's tough because I think more than anything, you have to go young when you're talking about this kind of team and not try to press ahead. Like maybe they get somebody following their lap. Like for instance, last summer they signed Alex Lynn and they got panned for that in some circles, but he was actually pretty good this year and he was young. He was 25 and you know him well from Phoenix. So like he was, uh, you know, not someone who was great in Phoenix, but he's sort of a nice by low kind of candidate that made some sense and is now like a pretty solid rotation player. Um, that kind of guy like Jordan bell has been a popular name in my circles um, as like a project kind of young by low candidate. If I had to pick one guy who's actually good already that they could sign and make some sense, it's Derek favors, which is interesting because he's actually a local product, but I could picture him with John Collins and he's young enough where you wouldn't you know, embarrass yourself trying to give him a, try to give him say, a multi-year contract and he's legitimately good. So if you had to, if I had to pick one guy, that's like my favorite, you know, semi high end free agent target, it would be Derek favors. But honestly, it's really hard to find those guys because you want to get someone who's young enough that if you, if you get, if you get those guys three or four years, they still make sense at the end of the deal. And that's kind of a interesting place to be when you're still in this rebuild. I was looking down the list of, of free agents like you were just talking about and just it seemed to me when I was looking at the defensive players or some of the players who are going to play a higher end defense and might, you know, be willing to come for shorter term contracts that kind of match what the Hawks are going for anyway. It looked like it was all X Hawks. Like uh, the yeah. only the players that I could see DeMari like Carroll. putting in there yeah. was like, yeah, Damari Carroll, like you could even make an argument for Millsap or Horford, but you know, that's probably out of the spending range that the Hawks want to get into. 
I mean, Horford would be so perfect if he was like four years younger. (laughs) He would be absolutely ideal in every way, uh, except he's already, you know, 30. You don't want to give him multiple years. He'd be awesome. (laughs) Um, So I guess, you know, putting a little bit more of a a definition to that to wrap things up tonight, just what, what do you see as the Hawks window right now? How far away do you think this team is? Like if you're trying to sign more defensive minded players to shorter term contracts, what length of those contracts do you think that might be? Yeah, I mean, to, to Brian's point a minute ago, like I think the playoffs is a reasonable goal next year. I, I wouldn't be like mortgaging the future to go ahead and do that. But I think just with natural evolution of your current roster combined with the ugliness that's the bottom of the East, they could be the eight seed. And I wouldn't be surprised in any way, even with marginal additions in free agency. You know, they, they probably they pretty easily could have won 32 games this year. They ended up with 29 with some interesting creativity at the end of the year, we'll say. So, you know, four or five more wins and you're in the, and you're in the playoffs in the East, which is kind of crazy. But yeah, I'd be looking for short term, like maybe two year contracts. I think keeping the books clean is important. And after this coming season, they had even more cap space because they have Kent Bazemore coming off and miles Plumlee coming off. And those guys combined to make like $32 million, which is crazy to say out loud, but they do. Um, so yeah, I mean, ideally, you want to set the set the books for 2020 and just keep things really clean for that. Um, but you know, obviously one year deals are a little bit harder to find. So, you know, anything in the two year range or shorter, would be what I was trying to do. And then you're sort of resetting and aiming to where you can make your actual big leap in probably two years. Cause this, this year, barring a crazy free agent addition, you're not going to be able to make any real noise. But the year after that, if you get the prog- the progression from young and young and Collins and Herder and whoever else, maybe you start talking about, you know, making a run towards top four stuff in the East. And then from there, Brad, appreciate you coming on, spending some time with us, filling us in on what we need to know from the Hawks. It's, it's good to talk with you because I feel like we've had a couple other teams on now. We've had like, you know, Lakers Clippers and you know, a, a few other uh, Charlotte and everyone. And I feel like everyone's trying to like poach players from who the Knicks are going to sign, whether it be, <laughs> you know, Kyrie or Katie or Kemba or whoever. And I don't feel that kind of threat from the Hawks. So this is very friendly and I appreciate it. Yeah, I think they're going to call KD and it'll last about 30 <laughs> seconds and that'll be the end of that. But other, yeah, Kyrie and Kemba are not Hawks targets. So uh, be uh, be assured of that. Uh, you can listen to Locked on Hawks and follow them on Twitter at Locked on Hawks. Uh, Brad is also a contributor over at Peachtree Hoops on SB Nation. That's at Peachtree Hoops. Uh, follow him at BT Rowland. Brad, thanks again. My pleasure, guys. Talk soon. Take care. All right. Thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks to Brad Roland for coming on. Really appreciate it. Uh, make sure you're all catching up on the nixwall.com. We just ran some, uh, we uh, made some updates courtesy of Ryan Gray and, and uh, Jess Reinhardt on the Nixwall. They really came together for us and they, uh, you know, they made the update to the uh, off season simulator. You uh, now, when you enter into it, the lottery will be exactly as it just happened on Tuesday. And you'll be able to make some calls on what the Knicks will be doing with that third pick. And, you know, go through the rest of the game and make, do your simulations and figure out what the records are. And uh, let's see, we got a couple of good ones before we get out of here tonight. We got uh, from Mike at Mr. Carosa on Twitter. We got a uh, 80 trade. We got a 60 and 22 Kevin Durant, Kawhi Leonard, pretty much dream scenario at this point. Um, let's see any other interesting ones come through. We got the Barrett, the KD, and the Kawhi. That's giving you a 58 and 24. Considering that's only two wins off of the AD one, I don't know. It's something to consider. I like I like uh, the one with the glitch that was 71 and 11. <laughs> uh, we can hope. I like this one, too. Uh, this one, we got Barrett. We got Kyrie. We got uh, Clay Thompson. Then we brought Melo back for a 45-win season. No. Uh, yeah, that's not, not a dream scenario, but, uh, you know take it um anyway that one that last one came from Kalyn or trinity and uh before that we had wow you guys are not making it easy with the ads today both scott biscotchi six yeah we'll go with that um so make sure you guys are following along there play along with our game send in your results to uh at the next wall po- or, or at tkw podcast sorry 
Uh, make sure you're subscribed to the Knicks Wall podcast. Make sure uh, on YouTube, on iTunes, anywhere else, any other platform, or if you're having any trouble with your platform, uh, go ahead and unsubscribe and resubscribe again. We've had a couple of people writing in since our RSS change. Um, yeah, you know, follow the Knicks Wall on Twitter. Uh, keep up with us. Follow Corvo Anthony. Follow at Brian Gibberman. Follow at Kyle Maggio for pictures of newborn puppies. And uh, yeah, we'll talk to you all this weekend. Listen to draft season two with Mike Cortez. And we'll talk to you later.